Here's what happens when you lazy f this last week. This time on Graveyard Cars, the parts room desperately needs an order to prepare for the assembly of the newly arrived 1971 Cuda convertible. And there's a elephant in the room after Mark was gifted a third generation 426 Hell Crate engine at SEMA Show 2018. The pressure is on to decide what car will receive this epic 1,000 horsepower beast. The unburied, the unburied dead, dead, the unburied dead are coming back, coming back to life. Are coming back to life. Self-proclaimed Mopar master Mark Warman and his protege painter Will Scott get paid to bring Mopar muscle cars back from the dead. They work with Mark's daughter, Alyssa, and his cousin, Dougie. They're willing to travel anywhere to retrieve a customer's car, detailing how it lived its life and how it died. After that, they bring it back to make it look just like it did the day it was born. Mark and Dougie are in the machine shop getting ready to build out a 426 Hemi for a 1966 Dodge Charger, currently in the bodywork stage of its restoration. Side by side with a 446 barrel from a 1970 Roadrunner, currently in the queue for restoration, Mark wants to provide a teaching moment with his cousin Dougie. So what I wanted to do was take a minute and talk about the cylinder head, the main difference in that cylinder head and in the pistons between the wedge and the Hemi. So why are you? Just gaze. What? No, you're okay. I just wonder why you're... The reason the heads are so desirable, the reason the engines are so desirable for the 426 Hemi, because they perform like nothing else. They move more air, more fuel through them than any other engine on the planet. Now, when we turn them over, first thing you'll notice, two things. Look at the dome up in here. Look at the CCs inside that head versus the wedge. Two, take a look at the intake and the exhaust valves. Those are big, those are huge. What is the measurement of that? The intake? Yep, intake right there. 202? 225. Supposed... I got it. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I did. Okay, I'm glad you got your notes down there. <laughs> you know what the size of the exhaust valve is on the 426 Hemi? 194, that's right. Oh, I got you know one. the answer? You should throw it right out there. What is the intake valve size on the 440 wedge? I don't remember. Well, look at your cheat sheet. Oh, it's down there. <laughs> well, it hasn't moved. 174 and 208. 174 uh -huh. and 208. Very good, Doug. What? Nothing. I'm saying you did good. Oh, thank you. You're, you're, you're doing fine. Absolutely. That's pretty good. All right. Because of the hemispherical design, these opposing valves and this high dome in here, you can get a lot more fuel through this combustion chamber faster and more than you can inside this one. All right? Mm -hmm. So when we bolt this on the car, that piston is gonna come up into this area. This one, it lays flat. But when these valves open up, they're gonna wanna hit the piston. So on the 446 pack, because of the 10 and a half to one compression, they put fly cuts in those pistons. All right? So let's talk about the dome piston and the flat piston on the wedge. So on the Hemi, you see how high that dome is, all right? This thing produces 10.25 to one compression ratio. Now our 440, being it's a six pack engine, uses a different piston than a 440 Magnum. The height is different, and that ends us up with a 10 and a half to one ratio. So the 440 actually has higher compression ratio than the Hemi. And the way they did it is they brought the height of this piston all the way up to here. And that goes and fits up inside the dome of the cylinder, right, the, the combustion chamber. But if it didn't have this cut and this cut, then the valves would just punch holes in the pistons, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they figured it out that if this is the finish height of the piston when it's all done, and the heads are the stock uh, CCs, and you cut this right here, it gives you the end compression ratio of 10 and a half to one. Which that's a lot sexier looking piston, by the yes, way. Yes, it is. Would you say so? I would. Did your 340 have those in it? His story's about his 340 always cracked me up. 
12, 12 to 1. Yeah, right. 14 12 to, to one. 1. Yeah, 14. Yeah, it would actually run on water. The compression was so high it would run on water. But for some reason, my 1970 Dodge Charger with a 440 Magnum would walk the tail end off of the old girl. No comment. Okay. Mm. Over on the wedge engine, you got a flat topped piston. But the height of it comes up so far. You see how it's flush against the deck right there? Uh huh. It has to fly cut them. Just like those are fly cut a little bit, these are fly cut for the intake and the exhaust valve. So which one of those would you say that one accommodates? You know the answer, just shoot it right <laughs> out. Exhaust. Okay, no. This one's gonna be the intake, and that one's gonna be the exhaust. Because oh. isn't the intake valve bigger than the exhaust valve? Uh-huh. So probably the hole would be bigger too, right? Yeah. Okay. The fly cut? The fly cut, yeah, sure, the fly cut. We can call it that if you want to. So you see that they're a little different, right? That's a little bigger? A little bit, sure, sure it is, sure it is. With that, we will take this over, and what do you think about putting a cylinder head on this engine right here? You like the sound of it? Yeah. You think this is the right gasket? Uh-huh. You like it? Yeah. All right. Well, let's lift that bad boy up. Yes, sir. Yeah, she's a weight. She's a weighty old girl. Uh, okay, right down here. Okay, so before you can actually torque the head down, put all the bolts in and torque the head down on a 426 Hemi, you have to have the rocker shaft assembly in place. And this is different than a wedge engine. On a wedge engine, the rocker shaft can bolt in after the head bolts are in place. But on this one, the actual head bolts themselves will go down through the rocker stands, five of them anyway, and then the rest of the bolts and studs will go into place. The other thing about the 426 Hemi, unlike the wedge engine, the push rods are two different lengths. So here is an exhaust push rod. Here is an intake push rod. Now Mancini hooked us up with all this stuff because it's hard to find anything good anymore in the way of used original stuff. We're using the ARP bolts because again, you can't see them. You don't know if it's right or wrong, but these are brand new heavy duty bolts. But if you look here, there's the difference in your height, okay? This is your intake, this is your exhaust. That means that the intake actually rides down further than the exhaust does. So again, making sure you have the intake in the right spot and the exhaust in the right spot before you put them together. So with that, I believe we are ready to proceed. Yeah. Yes, we are. Uh-huh. Did Frankenstein get hold of you? I just noticed that you got a haircut, didn't you? Uh-huh. It looks good. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> So now we'll just put in our different bolts. We've got the nuts in place. We'll just run these down a little bit with the wrench. So we're just gonna put a little something on there. Take the slack out of the bolt. You guys are gonna be listening for the click. Click. All right, number two. Number three. And 17, measure IQ, and that goes down there. No! <laughs> oh, you're sweating. Stop it. Don't be sweating on a cold day. All right, good job. Thank you. Give you a little high five with a normal hand. All right, cylinder heads are on, bolted, torqued, rocker shafts next. But that's what I wanted to show you is the difference between that wedge head and the hemi head and exactly how you put one on when you're doing it right. So I'm going to leave you to the rest of them. If you're looking for me, I'll be upstairs asleep. <laughs> They're a butte, Clark, a butte. Our 1971 Plymouth Cuda convertible BS27 H1B 340 with a D13 manual transmission. Just came out of the paint shop. So we are getting ready to go over the entire parts order that we need to put into Classic Industries and the different vendors so that we can start assembling the car.
This is a 1971 CUDA 340 convertible. It left the factory with a manual three-speed transmission. While that's not a super sexy transmission by any means, it makes this special drop top one of only eight cars produced. Now, when you factor in that this car is painted FC7 in violet with a white bucket seat interior and matching white convertible top, it's very likely this is the only one to ever come out of Hamtramck, Michigan. That's new. Gear. Parts catalog or something? <laughs> I need to, uh, oh my I can be pretty fast that? and what you guys will world? be able to catch everything, I'm reasonably sure. Dad, what is that? Just a headset so that I can do, uh, rattle off these parts real quick. You won't get them all. A headset? This is what I do every day. They make them smaller now, I think. Oh, so we this all know. This the, records you? The best way to do this is. Well, really, what's going on here? <laughs> this is going to record my list. Is this funny? Well, then why are we here? No, because you guys need to write it down and get acclimated. You can sit there and listen to it on tape. I'll do that later. I'll come out with my own order parts on tape. But right now, you need to write them down so you get the jargon and what to watch for when you're doing it. Always have the fender tag. Always have the fender tag in your hand or the broadcast sheet. Because there's okay. going to be things coming along here that we're going to have to ask questions on. Right? Okay. All righty. We start at the front of the vehicle. We work our way to the back of the vehicle. All right, we're going to need a front bumper chrome face bar. With some new technicians in the shop, Will checks in on the jamming prep for a 1971 Cuda to be painted in rally red. Well, that looks very good. Is it coming off pretty easy? That? Is it coming off pretty easy? Yeah, a little bit. So I got Delaney's car moved over to assembly. Uh, car looks great. Mark and I were kind of going over QC and just having just double check a few things before they actually start building the car, just in case an extra set of eyes is always good to have. While we were doing that, we had noticed there was a couple issues on our 1970 Cuda. We have a new guy that had just started. I took, took him, kind of showed him some of the issues that need to be addressed in the engine compartment, which basically stripping it down to bare metal was just the best way to start. And you could really see what you're working with. Grill mounting hardware kit, cowl screens, we're gonna recondition those. We do want the new fender well block off flaps. They go on that side over there and this side over here. They have little metal clips that hold them in place. We want new ones of those. We want to order the fuel lines for it. So this is a 71. So it has the vapor return line that mounts up here and a 5 16 main fuel line that goes up to the engine. Fuel tank, sending unit, straps, J bolts. We've got to get the dash assembly sent off to instrument specialties for a complete restoration. I want to reset the odometer to zero and modify the AM radio to an AM FM MP3 with an original look to it. Firewall insulation under dash insulation. Steering column needs to be restored. We have all the pieces to do it in stock. Front seat upholstery, white buckets, no console. White interior door trim panels. Seat belts. What color M25. seat belts are, is this getting? Seat belts go black in this. Black, okay. White car gets black belts. Seat spacer kit, seat spacer nuts. Shift bezel boot, shift bezel. Get those from Pass On Performance. They're the ones that are doing all of our transmissions now. They've already rebuilt the three speed for it. Mm. Now that the engine compartment's completely stripped, I can really go through, assess the metal, really look at all the little details, because it's a camera area, so you do see engine compartments, and you see about 50% of them. But it does look good. A couple things I'll take the new guy through, kind of show him what I want to do. We'll get those things addressed and then move on to the next process. That all looks really good. So next, we'll level the car out and then I'll have you start inside the cab. You don't have to strip it down to bare metal, but I'll get you a DA and kind of show you what the inside of this looks like. So this is the first time I've done a Rally Red. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous color. It pops. This car is going to be stunning when it was done. Wow. There, when I came back, there was one that was already done by the former crew. It was just a gorgeous car all the way around. So it does make it more exciting when you're doing a fresh color that you have not done. And when you roll it over there with some of the other great colors we have in the assembly shop, this is really gonna pop with the rest of them. Still to come, Mark and Alyssa place an emergency parts order for the 1971 Cuda convertible. Why don't we wear this one? This one's cool. Because it's not a Roadrunner. It's purple. And Mark hears out Will on what car he thinks should receive the third generation 426 Hell Crate Hemi. This is literally 10 minutes of my life that I will never get back. To be revealed at SEMA Show 2019.
If you walked into a dealership in 1969, the new base model 1970 Dodge Super B would have cost you just above $3,000. It came standard with a 335 horsepower 383 four barrel and a three speed manual transmission, making it Dodge's low priced, power packed muscle car. Interestingly, the 1970 Super B is a redesign from its earlier iterations, which some considered a rebadge of the Plymouth Roadrunner. The most dramatic change was the new front end that consisted of a twin-looped front bumper that Dodge referred to as the Bumblebee Wings. As Dick Landy purportedly said, the Super B is truly the budget supercar for the man who wants a big car performance without spending a bundle for it. And it's for these reasons that this 1970 Super B is our Corpse of the Week. In the body shop, Curious George is working on a 1970 Cuda with a 340. When the owner bought the car back in the late 1980s, it had already been painted several times, with the last paint being white with AAR style striping. With rust everywhere, George is giving it some much needed TLC. Meanwhile, back in assembly, Mark finishes his perpetual parts order performance. Okay. That it doesn't get it. The nameplates that go on the door trim panels that call out the word CUDA, they'll need to be replaced. Okay. Okay. Phoenix Graphics is going to give us the white billboard. This is not a white billboard car, but the owner would like to add it, and that's fine. That's what you and Will are going to work on, Alyssa. You guys did Again. so good on Yeah, yeah. <laughs> order five sets, and we'll try to get those out of it. Because when you guys go through the first four, I'll come in and put the last one on right the first time. Stainless steel, round up all the stainless steel that doesn't get replaced, such as the convertible top molding. Let's get those sent out to have them polished, okay. straightened and polished. We need new rocker moldings and rocker molding clips. 71, all has them. Trunk mat, body plugs, body bumper kit. We've got tail, light, lenses, tail, light, bezels. We have the housings. We need the nameplate that says by Plymouth for the rear tail panel and the one that calls out CUDA. We need to get hold of our friends down at Accurate Exhaust and tell them we would like a complete dual exhaust system for this engine. Give him the casting numbers that are on the exhaust manifold so it is correct. The wheels and the tires. This car was originally a 14-inch wheel car. The owner would like to put 15 sevens on it, so we're going to order those from Classic Industry. 15 by 7 rally wheels with center caps, trim rings, and acorn lug nuts. Uh, you're going to need to order the fuel tank for it. Check the glass, make sure it's all good. If it isn't good, order a brand new set of glass all the way through, non-tinted for this car. None. Rear bumper, rear bumper brackets, rear valance hardware. Need the name plates on the hood that call out CUDA 340. Heater box rebuild kit. Gonna wanna get a heater box rebuilt okay. for it coming. Hopefully the original A-pillar interior trim moldings are good because Tony makes them for a hard top, but he doesn't make them for the convertible, so hopefully they're good. If they are, we save them at all costs. They okay. should be black is my guess. There are convertible top weather strips that need to be replaced. Find out if Metro has those. Okay. They do order them from Metro. You're gonna wanna get a dimmer switch for the floor, a new one. Okay, any questions of me? Well, no, I'm back at number one, chrome face bar. So waiting on Willie right now to show up. I just paged him to the office. Want to talk about SEMA 2018. Get his feedback on. I'm also looking to find out what kind of a suggestion he might have for the 1,000 horsepower all aluminum 426 Hemi third generation, the very first one in the world that was given to me. Uh, well, he thinks we ought to put it in, so. Of course, I paged him five minutes ago. It takes him a little while to get up here. He's a very cool cat. Here he come right now. Little Willie, <laughs> little Willie, oh, Willie won't. won't Hello. What? Huh? Won't what? Quit drinking and drinking the alcohol. Mark's called me up to the office. I really have no idea why, but most times it's usually a waste of time. But hopefully it's something good this time. What do you want to see me about? Hi. Hi. SEMA 2018. Little Dead Wagon, one of the most talked about vehicles at the show. You're welcome for that. A lot of jealousy going on out there in the world. I don't think so. SEMA 18 went great. I'm glad it's behind us. We got the A100 dialed in as soon as we got back. Now that that's done, we've got to focus on 19, and hopefully we can start this project, you know, now, as opposed to waiting like three months before SEMA like we did last year. As you're painfully aware, uh, Mopar 
Let It Go. It's 2017. It's the still, only one they've ever I given still, out. So. It's still old. It's 2017. I think it's time to take that award and just move it outside to the shop because his head's getting bigger every year we do stuff. Mopar, these guys, make sure you can see me too, gave me the very first. I was there. Third generation. I was there. All aluminum. I was there. Crate Hemi that produces 1,000 horsepower. I would like to get your feedback on SEMA 2019, if you're still here. Why wouldn't I be? Well, just, you never know. People get a little bit for their britches once they get yeah. on TV. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you <laughs> that one. They're happy today, yeah. and then tomorrow somebody <laughs> says, you the man. <laughs> what do you think we ought to put that 1,000 horsepower? Bad boy, bad boy, what you going to do? What you going to do when I come for you? Please, man, get in the pop age and the man get in the... What are the lyrics to that song? That's the weirdest song. Well, my favorite car is a 70 Cuda, by far. What would you do with Cuda, real quick? What color, what, what, uh, trans Kind of like the, like a full, like, resto mod type. Like we did two years ago? C but complete. You know, the full interior. Uh, there was a charger. Oh, you mean restaurant? You mean customized? The Just full, yeah. Full blown butcher. Okay. Okay, I'm thinking about that. It's becoming more popular. You know, these guys that buy these cars, they're high dollar cars, they want the comfort of driving a new car while still having the look of an old one. And that's just something we haven't done yet, so I think it would be cool to get on board and kind of go that route on the occasion. There was like a 68 Charger that was down there. I saw it. With the complete interior. Yep. That was cool. It was a wild car. And it was done nice. I actually thought that was a cool car and it was done really nice. Yeah, yeah, so maybe something along those lines. But, you know, we have done already, we did a muscle car, right? We did the Superbird, we did the mm -hmm. Cuda. We are a muscle car, we are a muscle car. Right. I, I'm with you. I, I truly want to do a 70 Cuda, full interior of a new car. So full leather, like Recaro yep. seats, all like the, the inside seat. of your car. Heated seats, and a thousand power horsepower, windows. and then what? Beef up the rest of the chassis yep. to handle it. Yep. Have Ron come up and do all of his suspension underneath it. And that would be the <laughs> ultimate car. That's the ultimate car. Yeah. I like it. And then painted a really cool color. I like it. I'm not gonna lie to you. I like it. But give me another. No, I like no, it. No, that's what I want. I'm just looking no, for two or three ideas from you before I could choose, is that all right? No, that's what I want. That's, okay, that's Like when I came in here no, for the I know A100. you're used to getting what you want because your parents spoiled you your entire life, but let's say you couldn't have that, what else would it be? You literally age people around you. We do these cool cars, but we never do it to that extreme. So I, I was really hoping that we'd do something along those lines this year. Give so me one like, more. Anything else? Well, if we do, it would be cool to do a truck. It would be cool to do a truck. Yeah. Which truck would you do? Like a dog, like a little power wagon. I like your ideas. I'm not going with any of them. I actually already got the car. What I was wondering was what kind of crazy concoctions what? you're going to have for the next five nope. SEMAs so you can... <laughs> you have the car. I want to head that off at the pack. You have the car. Yeah, absolutely. It's outside. So apparently this meeting was a complete waste of time. He's already got the car. This is literally 10 minutes of my life that I will never get back. I wouldn't say that. Well, no, I would say that. <laughs> I would say that. Well, what's the car? Um, I can't tell you. So why am I here? Meeting adjourned. Why am I here? I wanted to hear what your ideas were for SEMA. They have no bearing on anything, because you've purchased the car already. Oh yeah, it's I had here. no intention of doing anything you said. It's gonna be either something from his childhood or something from a movie or something that he's thought up in his head that he's always wanted when he, uh, when he got older. Who knows? <laughs> I'm just gonna think twice before coming in here next time he's gonna have a meeting. Hey. <laughs> what? Mi casa es su casa. I just hope that it's actually something cool and something different than what we normally do. Knowledge is power. We learned in the Corpse of the Week that it would have cost you just over $3,000 for a base model 1970 Dodge Super B. How much would it have cost you to upgrade your engine from the standard 383 four barrel to the optional 446 pack? Was it $119, $848, dollars Think you know? Find out after the break. Okay, Ghouls, how much would it have cost you to upgrade your engine from the standard 383 four barrel to the optional 446 pack? 
$119 is how much it would have cost you if you had a Coronet RT. $848 is how much it would have cost if you upgraded to the 426 Hemi. That leaves $249 as the cost to upgrade. Also, that would have given you a 12,000 mile warranty. Will checks in on the progress of the jamming prep on the 1970 Cuda. All these little grinder marks that he made, they need to be sanded back. So that way when the paint goes on top of it, it just looks cleaner. On the inside of these marks, super anal, that the inside looks just as good as the outside. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's awesome. So we just gotta spend the extra time doing it. I mean, you, it gets dynamat over it, the carpet, you never see any of it, but he's still really, really picky about all of it looking just as good. In case somebody ever takes it apart, and they could look in there and say, holy crap, they actually do a lot of detail work in there. Yeah. So this is our DA, um, and you really can't mess this up. It's pretty self-explanatory. We do have some Bondo work to do, which I'll show you as we get further on in the process. But right now, it's just about getting all this sanded so the paint sticks and getting rid of all this crap here. So I, by taking the extra time to just address these little things, it makes it to where when we actually do the paint work on the jams, it looks just like the outside of the car. Other than that, yeah, just start sanding out the, this whole inside and getting all those grinder marks out of there and, and just make it look pretty. Sounds good. So it's just overall just a better quality for us. It gives us a better name, reputation, and the car just lasts that much better and it just makes you more proud. Factory didn't do that and a lot of resto shops don't do that now. But by painting every square inch, it'll never rust. These cars are covered top to bottom, so it's just the best and safest way to go. With the 1971 Cuda convertible in the assembly shop and the parts room nearly empty of its inventory, Mark and Alyssa go through the catalog to get the parts they need for the Cuda's final assembly. 70. So we don't have any, have any in stock. Uh, okay, so how many would you? A set. We just need to. Let's do one set for inventory and one set for the car. So the only things I'm not wanting to order two of are things that are unique to a car, like white interior. Okay. We could add, we Does could be a year here? before we ever get another white interior yeah. car. I'll just call and order that stuff. Is this the one we just ordered? No, we ordered these. Why don't we order this one? This one's cool. Because it's not a Roadrunner. Why well, would we put a Roadrunner horn on a on a non-Roadrunner car? Yeah. It's purple. If the car's purple. Oh well, it if it's looks purple good. and the car's purple, we should put it on there. I am beginning to think that the apple fell way off the tree. Yeah, I've, I've thought that for a long time. Okay, so let's go over to seats. And this is not the White page ones here. right here, these ones are cool. Those are awesome, I love the cutouts on the top too. <laughs> They're racing seats, they're pro car sportsmen. Why would you don't- Maybe Delaney wants to race his car. I, I don't think he him? does. No, why would, if he wanted to race it, then go do the seat later, we're an OE restoration shop. Why would we, I, I don't. Okay. Okay, well, which ones then? Well, how about the ones that it came with? Oh, here's foams. Okay, let's do the foams real quick because we're going to want to do new seat foams. Okay. 772 E body. We've got a 71 bucket seat foam per seat or a pair. And this is for our standard interior. Uh, Michael David 2012. Let's order two sets of those so we have one on the shelf and one for the car. They are $233.99 for a pair. The seat backs, these I do not like. They do not look very good. These look exactly like they're supposed to. That is going to be a 71 What's the part number? E-body. Well, I'm looking here, I'm looking at color. Oh, yeah, there's still a whole catalog. Can we get some us. better uh, seats in here? No, these are nice. What is wrong with, what do you want in here? A like recliner? a back? Yeah, maybe something. No, you a don't need shorter. a back. You need to work on your posture. So I can feel more comfortable. How you, come they you'd never the make it in prison. Well, no, I wouldn't. I would not make it. 
Neither um, would you. See, you're a big guy on campus here, but you go to prison, you're one of the little guys. Oh, am I? I think Graveyard Cars is probably pretty well known in prison. They got closed circuit. <laughs> okay. I'll be a celebrity in there. <laughs>'re injection molded these are the good ones these are the bad boys so what's cool about these is for a long time nobody made them they're injection molded plastic and they are the color of whatever the interior is black white or blue or whatever <clears throat> the first round that came out and went around were terrible the first people that remade them awful they were way too shiny the grain was too big it just wasn't a good part but now classics making them and they're injection molded with the black or the white and they are exact replicas of the originals if you take a white door trim pound go down and look at Doug's the ones out of a 70 Barracuda Grand Coupe and you look at them all the grains gone on them and you can see where they're just chalky just like that you can take your fingernails and just dig them yeah, they're seen. old and chalky these are brand new, they're beautiful, they fit like they're supposed to. So the front ones are Michael Echo 859-200, and it's $529.99, and it's Barracuda front door interior trim panel in white. Tail light lenses, that's another great thing. So forever, these weren't available. And what happens is, they get old, they get warped. If you look at the back of some Kudas, you see they're actually sagging from the heat. If take a car down in Arizona or something, yeah. and it's sagging and not looking right. These are brand new and they're perfect. They're licensed by Chrysler. These are right. These are authentic restoration parts. So we're going to go with new lenses and new bezels, and that'll make the back of that thing just pop. Michael Echo 1529 is a tail light lens 71 Barracuda. Is the bezel the same? Same story, they didn't used to make those. They didn't they make do. those either, absolutely. Yeah, so much stuff's being made now that you could darn near build a car out of one of these books. Is Classic the only people that are doing it, or they're just doing it the best? I think there I think there are other companies making stuff, but the thing about these guys at Classic is they went out of their way, and they actually make them. They actually have their own manufacturing. So the other ones are just, a lot of times, they're just reselling stuff that these guys make. That's why oh, I just, Okay, so you go straight to the source. Go to the source and ask the horse. They'll give you the answer that you endorse, Mr. Ed. See, they're making the grills. Look at this stuff. You couldn't get them. We were paying two and three grand for a 70 Cuda grill and five grand for a 71, a mink, as Andy would call it, mink condition 71. They're making them. They're all, they're making them all. Okay, okay. I think we got it. Okay. Uh, I get the convertible top from them too, but I like to have a conversation with them. I don't want one that's been on the shelf for 35 years. We're good. 119 lines, very nice. All right. Okay, meeting as you earn. God, thank God. Are you going to stay up here by yourself? No, just checking in, seeing what the chicks on Twitter had to say to me. Yeah. You're the best. You make us want to be a better woman, you know. If that's the case, say la vie. In our Corpse of the Week, many people felt the original iteration of the Super B was a rebadging of the Roadrunner. True or false? The Super B name was a play on the B-body chassis it's built on. Find out after the break. The Super B name was a play on the B-body chassis it's built on. That is true. The Super B used the Coronet body, which was one inch longer than the Belvedere-based Roadrunner. It also featured die-cast chrome emblems, whereas the Roadrunner used decals. The dash was taken from a Dodge Charger, and manual transmissions used a Hearst shifter and linkage. All these changes elevated its market placement, but added over 60 pounds of weight.
you're in the booth right now with us, we have all of our fenders and our doors for our 1970 Cuda that's going rally red. Gorgeous color, we haven't done red in a while, so it's kind of nice to mix it up a little bit. Um, I'm gonna get these, all the paint work done on these. Not a whole lot to them, they're all scuffed, sanded, ready to go. Once I get them jammed, they'll be ready to hang on the car. So it's been like four years since we've done this color. Uh, we, and the last time we did it was on Mark Elena's 1970 Cuda. So it's pretty much the same exact cars before. A little bit different, but pretty much the same. Uh, so now we're gonna kick you guys out of here and get the color going on these parts. I need to come in here, seam seal just two of the seams that I had forgotten to do. Luckily, we caught that before we painted it. This just prevents for, uh, seam seal on that, that. It's a pretty good size seam that's right there. So by seam sealing it, it allows it not to, uh, when it rains, water doesn't get down in your dash area or inside the floorboard. So they just kind of went through, brushed it on there quick, all assembly line type stuff. Just get it done, nothing fancy. There's that side. It's, uh, it's pretty basic, it's nothing fancy at all. It takes like 10 minutes to dry. Make sure you do it over bare metal. And that's it. Paint won't stick to bare metal. So anything that's bare metal, you have to etch prime first. So you put that etch primer on there and it literally is just like it says, it does etch to the bare metal and then the paint will stick to the primer. This is the etch primer that we use, DP90. It's a good product. It, it, we've never had a problem with it. We put it on everything that we have that's bare metal. And uh, yeah, it doesn't fail at all. It's just a two to one mix. And then I usually do like a half a reducer just to thin it down just a little bit. So it sprays better. So this is just the edge primer. This, the regular primer that we use is actually a high build primer and that's what goes over Bondo. This edge primer is just strictly meant for going over bare metal. The high build just means it's, it's super thick and it's three or four coats and it, it'll have everything covered and that way we can make the car straight. The etch primer is really, really simple to spray. You go in there, make sure it's all wiped down clean. You don't need to spray the etch primer on very thick. Just make sure that you cover all the bare metal, and then that way you don't have to worry about any uh, paint falling off later. Back in the body shop, George continues surgery on the 1970 Cuda 340. When completed, this car will be our first to be painted FM3 Moulin Rouge, or Panther Pink in the Dodge lineup. Interestingly, the owner's wife wanted to drive the car, and not being fond of the idea, he pulled the engine out under the premise it needed detailing. It ended up being the last time the car drove. In the paint booth, Will adds the last bit of DP90, which gives the pre-paint something to adhere to, and then it's on to the actual jamming with Rally Red. It's time to get the single stage mixed up and make it red. And the car is going Rally Red. It's a gorgeous color. We haven't done it in quite a few years, uh, but and we're doing it in a single stage. So it does go a little bit quicker, so you're not having to actually do it base coat, clear coat. You go in three or four coats, and you're completely done. It's just as important to do the inside of the engine compartment as nice as the outside of the car. So it's one of those high camera areas that just has to look perfect from start to finish. And these guys go to car shows, stuff like that. That hood's always open. People want to look at the engine that's in there. And then you also want to see the quality of the paintwork. Once I get the engine bay wrapped up, we'll hop inside, get the cab done, and then we'll get the trunk done. Then at that point, we can hang this whole thing together, start blocking it for final paint.
got the engine compartment completely sprayed. That rally red single stage covered pretty quick. Looks gorgeous. Uh, I'm excited to do a red car because we haven't done one in quite some time. So at that point, we'll let this just sit in the booth and do its thing and dry. And then as we move forward, we'll get the cab done, inside the trunk done, get the car put together completely, block it out, clean it all up, make sure the car looks perfect, and then do our final paint job on it. Hey, I don't know, I've never seen anything like it before. But they go down to that show at SEMA and people tell them how awesome they are. And it's over, man. Well, I'm pretty they, close to having my own. They take, to be a, honest. they take a big drink of that Kool-Aid. Next thing you know, they got their own business. I'm one compliment away. Okay. This is the staging area right here. It's yeah, cold. Stand here. I'm so, going to go down now. I've got it in a trailer out front. Mark's drug me out here. We did his little uh, game in the office. Now it's time to come out here, and I guess he's going to show me the car that he purchased for SEMA. This is very, very quiet. I need your word that you won't say anything to anybody yes, about it. that's fine. Go get the car. You promise? Trust. Yes. You swear on your yes. mother's vision? I'm not going to. My mom. Yeah. Sweet little Denise. I love her, but so I, mean, I. I need no. to know that you mean it. No, how about I just give you my word? Go get the car. It's cold. It needs to be quiet, because I have to call Mopar, talk to them about revealing it in the booth in the way that I have envisioned. There's a lot of moving parts that go behind this vision that I have, and hopefully I can pull it off. Oh, you're a weirdo outside. You're. We live in Oregon. This better not be something dumb. It's negative 20 here in Oregon right now. Horrible. It's freezing cold. He always has to make an entrance. He's probably reluctant because he knows I'm nuts, right? He knows that I, I come up with some pretty crazy ideas and most of them never make it across the, the end finish line. They get left on the cutting room floor. Well, this is a lofty one, no doubt about it, but I do think it's possible. I think it's feasible. Run, Moochie! <laughs> Moochie! <laughs> this is pretty badass. Isn't this awesome? Yeah. All aluminum, 426 yeah, yeah, Hemi. We, we heard about it. We Controller, you know. No, we got it. Gonna build a 727 torque flight. I know what's going in it. That's, I know. Uh, yeah, it's going in That's pretty in. cool. This is awesome. It's just gonna be the biggest reveal in the history of SEMA. So here's, I doubt that. Well. I would have never in a million years guessed this. I have no problems doing this build at all and really look forward to it. I think it's gonna be just an iconic vehicle when it's all done and it already is. Now listen to me, listen solemnly to what I say. It is very important that you do not speak a word of this to anybody. To. Be fine. When the show starts and when you unveil the car, it is the first time anybody's heard, seen, smelt it, anything. That's called a surprise and that's called the winning edge. And that's why I believe if I can pull this off, it's gonna be one of the biggest reveals, if not the biggest, in the history of SEMA, so. This is the big one. I've got a meeting with Mopar. I've got to talk to them because the reveal that I have planned, I've got quite a few people, as a matter of fact, I have to talk to several directors of motion pictures. I have to talk to a couple of film studios down there in that area. Plus, I got to get hold, and I don't want to say the names, it'll give it away. Okay, yeah, I think this is very appropriate to, uh, to receive that 1,000 horsepower motor. Uh, it'll, it's gonna be a pretty big deal. Is this where we ramble on about how great you are for five minutes? No, not okay. about doing that. This, is, this isn't about me, this is about us. We're a great team. Oh, I believe that. Yeah, yeah. we're a good team, yeah. we are, yeah. This car is the first of its type. This engine is the first of its type. Nobody on the planet's ever done anything like this. They'll do it after that, they'll all do it after that, and they'll say what a great idea they had. But there's only one Picasso, one Rembrandt. So Just don't drink your own Kool-Aid. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Because in 1974, I, can't wait to get I was a young kid, had my paper out for three years. Three years I'd been saving up for my Yamaha Moto bike when I got it. Yeah, I didn't have my parents give me a Yamaha Zinger when I was two years old. I earned my stuff. So, might not be relevant, I don't care, it's, it's a point.